Hey, everyone. Uh, it's Russ, and welcome to another episode of Women's Retirement Radio. I'm really happy today to be uh, joined by Amy Rafaka, who is a uh, attorney uh, up on the north side of Atlanta. Uh, Amy, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Russ. Yeah, well, I'm glad you could join us, and uh, I'm excited to, uh, to talk with you. We haven't spoken in a while, but I always enjoy our conversations uh, why don't you start by uh, just telling people a little bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And I enjoy them as well. So I have a feeling that we're going to have a, a pretty nice conversation today. Uh, so my name is Amy Rafeka. I am an attorney. I do wills, trusts, powers of attorney, and you know, otherwise known as estate planning, and I focus on women. My tagline is I help women protect who they love the most, or we help women protect who they love the most. And uh, just super brief bio on me. I going on 20th year practicing in a uh, practicing law and have owned my own law firm for over a decade now, exclusively doing wills and trusts. I've never owned a law firm where I have done any other type of work. Uh, and I, you know, a few years into owning my own law firm, I started looking around and I started recognizing that uh, women needed to understand this process more. Um, but there were not a lot of opportunities in created spaces where I think that they were feeling welcomed into the process as much as I would have liked to have seen. And so that's why I created that space for them. And why do you think that is? I mean, why in your experience or from your perspective, why do you, why do you think that maybe there was a, a knowledge gap or uh, just uh, a, a, I like the phrase you use that women just didn't feel welcomed into the estate planning process. Why do you, why do you think that is? So I'm going to answer this question um, sort of personally and professionally. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So I, I believe, and it, it is an opinion um, that there were not a lot of created spaces because well, first, you know, I was I was raised by a single mother and um, watching a single mom raise three daughters. Um, I think that I, I walked away now as an adult looking backward, I walked away with the impression that um, there were probably moments where no one reached out to help her professionally um, in a safe environment. And then maybe there were times where she did not also reach out. Right. So and and. I always wanted to know why, like, why, you know, why is that? And I started realizing and recognizing as a woman myself that there are clear intended, unintended signs where questions are not welcome, you know, that I'm either just supposed to accept that, you know, this is the way it is in a, in a particular professional setting, whether that be a financial setting such as yourself or taxes or, um, you know, when I go buy a car or something um, and that, you know, that questions are sort of met with this look of why are you asking that question? And so professionally speaking, when I entered the field of law, I think that I was very taken aback with the um, overbearingness of many of my colleagues, uh, male and female, because we are taught to be that way in some on some level, to to have our voice be heard. We're the loudest. We're the last to speak. We're, you know, we need to get our point across. We need to be the the resident expert in the room. Um, much of this is actually sort of trained into us or encouraged through our, our professional training, whether it be at school or once we enter the legal field. And so when you have that environment, that that does not necessarily make someone feel welcome, let alone someone who has been fighting this their whole life in various subtle ways. Yeah, I we could probably spend an entire conversation just talking about this very issue. And, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I I do think it's important and needs to be addressed. Um, you know, you and I both share a focus on serving women. Um, and 
I too have found that, um, and, I, and I'd love your thoughts, women are in many respects uh, more capable, better suited to um, making smart decisions in the context of their life or their family or their long-term plan um, than their male counterparts. Um, yet uh, these same women who are capable, educated, um, you know, have the wherewithal to make these decisions, I think, um, do meet uh, obstacles, both explicit and implicit from people that uh, either imply they should know things or they shouldn't be asking these questions or uh, they almost, um, and, and I've heard this from women that I've met over time, you probably have too, that they just, they almost feel belittled by asking questions or not knowing enough. And as a result, they feel intimidated or overwhelmed and, and don't never ask the questions to begin with. I mean, would you say that's a, a fair characterization? I would. And I, I would even, um, yes, I, I definitely would. And I have felt I have felt that intimidation and, and, but for a personality where for whatever reason, it's just one of those gifts. And as a child, it was actually, they, it was um, encouraged to be kept silent. Basically. I never stopped asking questions, but definitely looking back now, I remember basically being told multiple times in my life, stop asking questions. You should just accept it. You, you know, that's not something that a lady does. You should act more ladylike. You, you know, not necessarily from my parents, but definitely from the education systems and, you know, all the systems in society. And so smart, educated, capable women are doing such powerful things right now. And I would 100% agree that many times for many reasons, they are the, in the best position to make some of the decisions, especially like, statistically speaking, they're going to outlast their male counterparts if they're in a committed relationship with a male. Uh, you know, they're going to care give potentially along the way if they're following some more traditional lines of who is the caregiver in the family and who, you know, they're going to care for, I always say they're going to care give for those above, they're going to care give for those to the side, and they're going to care give for those below more likely than not. Um, and that in and of itself in my field and probably yours as well puts them in a unique position to be a decision maker in a much more rounded way. It does. And it also, I think, um, underlines the need for these same women to make sure that their own financial and, uh, legal, um, situation is buttoned up and that they're protected and that, you know, if something happens, whether expected or unexpected, that their wishes are carried out and that they are able to um, continue to care for those that they love or, and that are important to them, as you kind of um, use to describe the tagline of your, of your firm and your, and your law practice. So uh, I think that, um, I think that's a nice way to kind of bring it back to um, uh, the fact that it's, I think it's great that we're having this conversation. And I think we're uh, very much aligned on many of these same, um, same perspectives. And maybe we'll touch on, on that some more throughout, uh, throughout our conversation today. But before we go further, Amy, um, I know you talked a little bit about your law practice and your upbringing. And I know before we hit record, you were talking about um, your son's travel baseball tournament this uh, past weekend. Mm -hmm. So clearly you've got a lot going on with your family, your law practice, um, your, um, your role in the community. Uh, but what's something about you uh, that maybe, uh, maybe people wouldn't be aware of or would not know? Oh, yeah. Um, I love to study religions for a hobby. <laughs> really? I, I do. I actually have my undergraduate degree in um, anthropology with an emphasis on archaeology. And I've always been fascinated with the confluence of like myth and culture and religion and society. I think it goes back to my, I want to know why. <laughs> I'm a why, 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 why? Ever since I was like, probably could speak, it would, may have been my first word. And so, yeah, so I 
I study religions just as a hobby, like all religions, ancient, mainstream. I study like, I study them. Yeah. So what's the most interesting religion or uh, religious practice that you have studied in recent memory that, that sticks out in your mind? Mm. It definitely would be, um, so, well, recent, the most recent practices that I've studied um, really is about mainstream Christianity um, and the different versions of Christianity, actually, <laughs> that existed um, in the first few hundred years um, after Christ was um, was persecuted. Um, and so for me, it's very fascinating to study this idea of there wasn't just this mono version. Um, so to me, it, it's that if it non-mainstream religion, um, I would, I would definitely have to say that, um, there, there are a few need, i my focus initially in undergraduate school was um, Native American populations. So basically the prehistory, um, pre-civilization, I guess, is the is the kind of term that people use in education to refer to Native religious practices here in the in the North America, uh, North American continent. And so I, yeah. I could probably go on a whole hour, but yes, there's some fascinating ways in which they viewed the worldview and the different levels that you seek on your journey through this world. Well, I, that certainly cl uh, classifies as an interesting, uh, interesting tidbit. So I'm glad, I'm glad you shared that. And, and maybe you and I'll have to have some offline conversations about that another time. Cause I, um, I don't know much, but I do find that fascinating and interesting as well. So, um, but back to your day job, yeah. um, <laughs> what's, um, what would you say, um, and, and there's probably more than one, but what would you say the biggest challenge is that you help people address or solve through your work? Education. Um, and I say that super quick because when you are putting in place an estate plan, you're, you are solving someone's problems. They have concerns, right? They come to you with, I call them their whys. You know, when we work with clients, we ask them, you know, what is your why? What, why did you pick up the phone? Why did you reach out? Why did you send an email? Why did you use my contact form on my website to reach out to us? What's going on, you know? And then we'll dig a little deeper, um, but then what I realize is what we're really solving is, is them really understanding that they do have to plan for this. You know, there are real issues that can arise um, when there is not a plan in place. So I think the number one thing that we really get to the heart of, and I think we are exceptionally good at it at Atlanta Wills and Trust Law Group, is educating them on why, you know, at the heart of it, why do they need an estate plan? You know, why do you need this document? Um, and then even, even if you feel everyone in your family knows, why is it important to put it in writing? And then, you know, like various things like that. And then the second thing I think that we do really, really well is, is explaining what their options available to them are. Um, and so I think that's the number one thing that we actually do for clients and we do we do satisfy their whys like we'll give them the appropriate plan for their specific reason that they did pick up that phone but the real why and the real heart of it is is just letting them understand why this is so important and why it is a so much more value than they could ever possibly give me in return and that's kind of the my philosophy in life is, is I want them to have so much more value than we, they could ever give me financially in return out of this. Um, and I want them to walk away feeling it deeply and knowing it. So I heard the word why in there several times, which I think is great. <laughs> um, could you give us, could you give us an example of if, if you ask a client, why, why did you pick up the phone or why did you send the email or why did you fill out the contact form on your website? Um, 
what's a what's an what's an answer that you clearly everybody's going to come at this from a little different perspective but what's what's an example of a you know what prompted them to pick up the phone or, or reach out to you I want to make sure that my sister who I want to take care of my children is the person who will be taking care of my children. I want to make sure that my children um, don't have a burden when I die that they, you know, I watched someone else and it, it just seemed like there were so many unanswered questions when my sister died and her, my nieces and nephews had to do this and that, and they didn't even know where she banked. Um, or they didn't know where all of our accounts were. So I don't want that to be my children. You know, I don't, I don't have that much, but I don't want them to not know these things. Um, that's a second, a really strong one. Um, third, you know, I would say um, they, they want to protect what's theirs. They want to make sure that the people who they want to have everything gets everything that they want or gets everything that they want them to have. So whether that be as a, as a, you know, a mom who has three adult children, you know, they all may be married or may or may not have children, but she wants those three children to have what she has worked hard for her whole life or her and her spouse has worked hard for her, their whole life to get it. Um, to, to get, to get it with, with ease, without a lot of disruption, without, you know, maybe they're worried about estate taxes, or maybe they're worried about attorney's fees, um, after they pass away, but they want to make sure that it goes to whom they want it to go to. I would say those are three big major whys. Well, those are all great specific examples, which I think are fantastic. And, and something that jumps out to me is you, you didn't say I've, you know, uh, for example, you didn't say a, a woman reaches out to you and says that we've we've achieved a certain net worth or we've um, it, it doesn't seem to be driven by uh, financial resources or a certain level of wealth. It seems to be more driven by uh, wanting to um, care for others, whether that's family, friends or organizations or. Um, I also heard you pretty clearly state that you want to prevent um, your death from being a, an undue burden on your children or your siblings or your surviving spouse or whatever, whatever your per personal situation may be. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, just like yourself, I, I work with a lot of women and I would say that's where they're, they're motivated and sure they, they could be very proud of what they've accumulated and, and earned and, and achieved. Um, at the end of the day, those are the, those are the things that they usually come to me and, and are concerned about. I work with a lot of women who don't have children um, and they are, they may or may not be in a committed relationship with someone else, but I, I think especially I see those women not being served well by my colleagues <laughs> in the space of estate planning, because there's not what, you know, is perceived as a natural heir to receive everything. There is also not a natural person to help them. And so in their eyes, they get a little lost. And so uh, and, and they're not being provided a lot of options and, and they especially don't want to be a burden on nieces and nephews. They don't, um, they don't, or they see it as a burden, but they, until we work through planning with them and then they see it as more of a, a gift to others, you know, what they've done for others is more of a gift to others, but, but yes, it's, I would definitely say that, that that's, you know, that's a big thing. It's, it's not motivated by money. It's very much motivated by, you know, ensuring that others are taken care of in the way that they've always maybe thought of them, you know, is, is being a caregiver for them. And something I'm wondering, maybe some of our listeners are as well, is there um, of the women that either approach you or are introduced or referred to you, is there a, a typical... Um, is there a typical age range or is there a typical kind of like profile of 
the women that you most often find yourself working with, or is it really kind of across the board? I would say there's three or four, if if I can indulge a little bit and just say there's like three or four. Yeah, um, please do. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that definitely I have um, sort of starting, you know, at the group where the most women that reach out to me, I would say they're in their 50s. Um, and they are... They may or may not have adult children, but they are, you know, they, they're thinking, Hey, I, I, I don't want, they're starting to see their, their friends become ill or their friends potentially get a diagnosis, um, that is concerning, or maybe themselves have had a diagnosis. I would say that they're, you know, typically educated in terms of they have college degrees, they've worked in the workforce at certain points during their lives. And they, they have some wealth, but it's not necessarily, I mean, it's not necessarily overwhelming amounts of wealth. And I say that very specifically because one of the first things they talk to me about, or I, I wouldn't call it dispelling a myth, but they're like, well, I just never really thought I needed it because I never thought I had enough to worry about. But I realize now that there are so many other things that might not be true. When we get to the details of it, they may actually have a larger estate than they actually realized, but that's not, like you said, what motivates them to come see me. Um, they're in their fifties. They, they just know they need to get this done. They've never gotten it done before. Or if they did, it was like right when children were born, like 35 years ago or something. Um, that's one, um, their highest priority is typically to organize and make sure that things are not going to be a burden on anyone. Um, I do work with women who, you know, may be married and they have young children. And so they have really high priorities um, for taking care of children who are under the age of 18. You know, here in Georgia, we call them minors. Well, every state they call them minors, but in Georgia, that's under the age of 18. Um, as many states, it's the 18 as well. And so they're in their 30s, their wealth building mode right? You probably use a term similar to that. Uh, they have children, you know, all sorts of age children, but usually under 12-ish. Um, and they're, they're more worried about, you know, making sure that something, something happens, somebody is taking care of those children and, and the money that they have will be, will be there for their children if something happens to them. I would say, honestly, you know, I hate to use terms like net worth, um, like what their total estate is worth. I mean, because I feel like that can put some people off because most people don't realize, you know, what they do have until you sit and talk to them about it. I mean, I don't know. What is your experience with with individuals, not just women, but most individuals don't realize their, you know, their estate value until you sit and break it down for them? Yeah, I mean, I... I agree. I think um, I think there's a couple of things there, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I think most people, uh, generally speaking, don't have a true understanding of the breadth of their financial situation, both um, assets um, and liabilities, and what that nets out to to give them a net worth figure. And then when it comes to someone's estate, um, they may have a five hundred thousand dollar term life policy, which um, doesn't really add to your net worth, but it is included as your estate. So there mm -hmm. are there are other things that can um, contribute and increase the value of your gross estate, even though you might not consider it when you're putting your net worth together. And I, I think that's a um, I think that's a point worth highlighting because I think people uh, often fail to recognize that. Yeah, that's definitely my experience with it. Um, and so. So yeah, I think that that those are probably the primary. I I, I work with um, women who are in um, marriages with like a same sex partner, um, either married or not married. So I we do work with them at Atlanta Wills and Trust Law Group, and I find that that community again um, has maybe not received the same tr treatment um, as we would have liked 
for them to have received in our estate plan by some estate planning colleagues. And so I definitely say that that is a demographic that that is attracted to us and our ability to educate um, and make safe places to ask meaningful questions. And so those are, I think, the three primary um, avatars, I guess you could say, or profiles of women that we work with. And yeah, so I think that that's to sum it up. Yeah, well, that's that's helpful. And I, I think that I suspect that helps give our listeners, uh, you know, a, a nice mental image of the different types of people that, you know, you have experience helping, serving and working with. Um, I know leading up to this conversation, you also share with me that you've been doing some work with uh, women that um, either um, own a business or maybe have recently started a business. Um, and it may be, um, you know, a, a business is such a subjective, subjective word. Mm -hmm. It might be um, something that, um, you know, more recent terminology might consider it kind of a side hustle or, or something like that. So it doesn't need to be like a, a, a business with a, a physical office location and a bunch of employees, but uh, you've been doing some work there, as I understand it, um, to help make sure that um, these businesses are um, protected and um, can, you know, live on uh, past uh, a woman's life, if so desired, or I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Why don't you, can you speak a little bit about to the work you've been doing around, uh, around those types of uh, women in their situations? Yes. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that, this up. I, I appreciate that. So again, I didn't start out and I think it kind of follows the, the pattern that I've suggested suggested once or twice, which is, <clears throat> I didn't recognize this and say, oh, I'm going to focus on this. But throughout working with women, two or three things have happened. And this is one of those things where I've recognized that many of the women that I work with will share with me almost as a side note <laughs> during our conversation, when we're talking about, you know, what makes up the, the demographics, what I like to refer to as like the biography of their lives. And they'll, they'll refer to an LLC that they might have, which is a form of business. Um, so, or they'll refer, they'll refer to the, the tutoring business that they have, or they'll refer to um, a, a bake, baked good business or, or a brick and mortar business that they have started. Um, but it, it usually doesn't necessarily come first in our conversations when we're talking about assets that we need to protect or, you know, what I like to refer to as assets are like the three buckets of like real property, you know, personal property, their stuff and money, you know? So when we're talking about the buckets of assets that we protect, they sort of side note, oh, and I have this business, but it's not a big deal. Um, or, or they may not even say that it's not a big deal, but the manner in which they, they bring it up to me. So I've recognized that, you know, one, I don't, you know, whether I'm asked or not, I always want to reaffirm to everyone that I work with, male and female, but especially female, that that business is meaningful, that business is worthy, that that business has value and you should protect it. And when I say protect it, that means it is a part of your estate and you should plan for being able to either to either pass that whole business on to the next generation, to whomever you want to pass it on to, or to pass the value of it on to the next generation. And so we work with a lot of um, entrepreneurs, business owners, which I kind of find those things to be sometimes two different things. Um, and sometimes we're working side by side with their business attorney. And sometimes we're working side by side with the tax person. Um, to make sure that, that, you know, what they put their energy into is, is thought of and is thought of in a meaningful way in their estate plan. And, and I don't know that we want to get too deep in the weeds on this, Amy, but could you, could you give it, maybe just give us a little bit more color around that? So let's say you've got a, a woman, she has a, a business of, of some size. Um, let's say she's got a business attorney and, or a, a tax preparer or a CPA involved. So, it, does that involve 
um, getting a valuation on the business and putting in some sort of succession plan or some type of uh, buy sell agreement if there are other owners in the business or what what does that typically look like? Um, typ- typical is probably, probably not the right word, but uh, what what might that look like um, given what you've described as as those types of clients? So I'll I'll describe a few things because I think it's helpful to to like you said put some color on it. So. You know, for the woman that comes and is working with me and she just has, she has an LLC and it's her and she has a virtual business and she creates um, maybe courses online for other teachers or other individuals in the education space. Um, You know, what we'll do is we'll typically they don't have a business attorney yet. So one of the things that we'll bring value to is we'll introduce them to a business attorney that can help them create the correct documents that someone would need um, when they have a business that they're doing, but they haven't actually legally formed it yet. Um, Or maybe they have just some, some baseline documents and they need something a little bit more so that they can allow their partner to step in or someone to step in if they become ill and they don't just lose the benefits of all of that work that they've put in the internet intellectual property that they've actually created in that business. I think that's a good example. Sometimes they just need an operating agreement. They need their powers of attorney to allow someone to step into a business to help protect something while they recover um, or if they don't recover to wind down for them um, and or sell if necessary. So that's one example. And I think that's a very common example that I find in my business. Um, You know, maybe I have a woman who has chosen to leave a profession and start something else that's a little bit more home-based, a little more flexible for their lifestyle so they can raise their child um, in a manner that they they want to. And so they've left behind a classroom, they've left behind corporate America and they're doing something else like consulting. Um, So that's a very good example. You know, to your point, when I have a business owner that's in a more formalized business structure, um, she needs things like key man insurance potentially to replace her or as you pointed out something that um, they don't even realize is she she may not even know what the documents say that she can do with her interests in a business so I'll point out well let's you know let's get someone else involved so that we can even see what you can do can your husband or can your partner step in and actually be an owner in this business or is there something about this business's creation documents that would prohibit that um and if you know we need to navigate something and we need to get other professionals in such as yourself or such as you know an accountant or a business attorney so that some things need to be created so they can allow a spouse or a partner to step in so that those interests are protected. Um, Then, yeah, I think that's kind of more my role in it. Sometimes I'm just identifying a situation and then bringing in another professional. And hearing you describe that, even uh, of all the scenarios and client situations we've discussed, I mean, and what I'm hearing you say is it, it really comes back to education, which is how you really kind of said is is what you really help people with uh, at the start of our conversation. Would you would you say that's accurate? I love that you saw that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. We we really we have five mission words at Atlanta Wills and Trust, and education is the first one. It's yeah. you know we just it's about just knowing it's about knowing and knowing what you don't know. And that's where going right back to the very beginning of what we talked about is if you have a safe place, then you can learn, you can ask questions. You can say, Hey, could you clarify that for me? Could, you know, do you mind? Like I'm a visual learner. Can you draw this out for me? Like just a safe place to ask those. Yeah. I mean, hearing you describe all this, Amy, it it reminds me of, um, the image that comes to, or the words that come to mind hearing you describe this is your, I, I, I think of you as like a compassionate guide, um, someone that knows 
the law and estate planning and wills and trusts and powers of attorney, et cetera, um, but can serve as a guide to help people um, think about things they may, maybe haven't thought of before or explore things that may be important to them that, you know, maybe they never thought to ask. Um, so I, I do love the, I do love that um, education is kind of a touchstone for you and your law firm and the services you provide. And, and again, that, I think that aligns very much with kind of my approach and, and how I try to help the women that I serve too. So um, I, I think it's just fortuitous that we're, we're talking and having this conversation. So, um, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was actually going to ask you a question. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, in what do you, in when your experience in working with women, and and you've been working with women longer than I have, um, in a professional capacity, um, I, I'm super curious. Like, what what are your experiences with, you know, why the the why you're seeing um, women gravitate to somebody who wants to work with women, like, and why education is so important, you know, like, I guess I'm sort of asking the question of, you know, I'm sure you get rebuffed sometimes. And, and as I do saying, well, the information's out there. If a woman wants it, she can just go get it. You know, but what is your experience with that? And like, why do you feel like they still want somebody to ask the questions of and to be to be a compassionate guide in a safe place? Yeah, well, uh, so thanks for asking. And um, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent because I want this call to be about you. But to answer your question, I think um, in my experience, there are a couple of catalysts. So um, I'm often referred or introduced to women that have gone through a divorce. Um, they're in their, you know, most of my clients are in their fifties and sixties. So they might've been married for 25, 30 plus years mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a lot of, not all, but in a lot of situations, um, their husband um, handled the finances uh, to a large part. And so uh, these women, again, capable, educated, um, super sharp, um, they just don't have the familiarity with the finances. And so um, they want someone that can, not just help them make smart decisions, but understand the context in which those decisions are being made, thus the education. So whether it's someone coming out of divorce or the loss of a spouse, and now they're, um, they're facing life as a widow, um, like you, I have a handful of clients that are single and have, have never been married. Um, and and what's, what I think is maybe the most interesting is I've actually been approached by um, some husbands that have said, um, I want someone that can partner with us um, and that can continue to work with my wife when I'm no longer around, um, which I, I find just, A, I'm, I'm completely blown away and, and flattered that someone would approach me under kind of under the circumstances, but um, I'm just blown away by that particular approach to decision making and, and that particular why. So um, I think I think I'm just scratching the surface, but those are kind of the the few that jump to my mind where um, women have gone through a, a major life transition, whether that's divorce, widowhood, or they're maybe they're selling a business or transitioning into retirement. Um, maybe um, maybe their husband, spouse, partner, maybe maybe I've actually had uh, a woman's father uh, approach me one time and say like, Hey, I, I, I'd love for you to work with my adult daughter, um, and just help her educate and, you know, so she can make smarter decisions. So it's a, it's been a, an interesting mix of situations. Um, but I don't know, does that maybe help answer your question, Amy? It does. I think, I think it does. I think in general, I would agree with all of the above. I too have been approached by, by husbands or fathers, of daughters who, you know, isn't that just, the most, isn't that the most gratifying thing ever? I mean, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of floored when, when that, when that happens. I, I am too. And I, you know, to me, it's, it's because they're, you know, they're clearly recognizing what you and I do as a gift to that person, you know, and they don't want 
anyone to take advantage of a moment of grief. They also, you know, in the, in the fact that they're trusting you with that too, you know, we're both in very traditional fields in terms of like who traditionally made the decisions in our fields. And so when you have a, a male approach you and, and say that, yeah, it's, it is fascinating and, and humbling, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, We've talked, we've, we've covered a lot, um, and this has been a, a wonderful conversation. Um, thinking back over your years serving women in your law practice, what's a favorite client success story that comes to mind for you, Amy? Hmm. Ooh. So I have two. Can I share two? You can share two. <laughs> okay. Um, so... One actually um, happened not so long ago, and it, uh, I've helped this individual over several years um, update a plan several times. And um, I think most recently, without sort of disclosing kind of the, the confidentiality around this particular client, recently um, this woman advised me how, how absolutely grateful she was to have had us in her corner during the life changes that happened, which precipitated those changes to the estate plan. Um, and she was a widow and, um, she, she, um, Again, let me navigate it a little bit. She didn't have a lot of individuals outside of her marriage. Um, and she was no longer you know, married when we started working with her. So she didn't have a lot of friends. She didn't have a lot of family. She didn't have a, a lot of support group outside of it. And so we helped her through a really difficult time after the passing of her spouse. And um since updated her estate plan and kind of watched her grow after that and meet individuals and, and for her to let us know how much we meant for her during that time um, when she was going through quite a bit and didn't have a lot of people to rely on that she felt safe enough to rely upon us and come back to us and refer people to us. To me, that, that meant the world that meant that we we did exactly what we were supposed to do, which was be a safe place for her. We, you know, we, we brought her more value than we could ever have in return from her because, you know, she, she found meaningful value in what we did. So that's one of my favorites. Um, uh, one question on that one. Uh, uh, I don't need a specific age, but approximately what age was this uh, woman when she first started working with you guys? <clears throat> she was, she was young in her, in her early fifties. Okay. Yeah. In her I, early fifties. Yeah. I, I didn't know, but I, I think oftentimes people associate widowhood with someone that's in their seventies, eighties or beyond. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that, that's actually the exception and not the rule. Um, I think the mm -hmm. average, I don't have the stat, uh, the stat in front of me. Yeah. I think the average age of the, of, of widows is, I want to say it's in, I want to say it's in the fifties. Um, not not 60s, 70s, or 80s. So, yeah. Um, I, I just I was just curious. Um, anyway, uh, sh share your uh, second favorite story with us. Yeah. So the so the the second favorite story um, is it's a little bit sad, um, but she because um, she she passed about a year and a half after we, we helped her with her planning. And it's a favorite of mine because she was one of those profiles that I just mentioned, which is she did not want any burden to be placed on her children. She loved her children dearly and she was unmarried. Um, she had a very vibrant lifestyle um, in terms of she was very active. She was very active um, in the arts community. And um, uh, uh, in terms of the states that I typically work with, it was, you know, middle of the road. You know, she had um, a, few, a few million in assets. And 
She um, mostly in accounts and things, but she wanted it organized. Um, and she wanted, she just wanted, she never wanted her daughters to have to make a decision about, you know, when should they withdraw treatment if something was prolonging the moment of death. So like end of life decision making. She did not want her her children to have to take that decision on. She wanted to make it for them. She wanted to make it for herself, but give it to them. She wanted organization. She wanted clear expectations of whose job would do what and when. Um, and we did that for her and she had, you know, all the opportunity in the world to ask questions about how to organize things. Cause you and I both know that the documents are only so good as the information that your family has about you. <laughs> right, right. Um, we call that if Atlanta wills and trust the plan around the plan, um, you need a plan around the plan. And so we helped her get that in place and uh, unexpectedly she had a diagnosis and pa- of a particular kind of aggressive cancer and passed about a year and a half after um, she worked with us and she, you know, she leading up to it, she let us know that she thought she would pass. And then her children who we, with whom we've worked with, you know, just were, they were very grateful for us that we helped their mother put everything in place and there was very little to do. <laughs> um, and it was, it was just organized. And so for me, like I, I was so eternally grateful to, to have had the opportunity to help her do exactly what she wanted to do. And so in terms of favorites, um, plus she was one of my favorites because she was so vibrant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, she was, I- she was younger too. She was in her sixties, early sixties when she got that diagnosis an unexpected diagnosis. She had not retired for very long. She, yeah. So yeah. Which, uh, which uh, my takeaway from that particular story is, you know, if, if she had just gotten busy or kicked the can down the road another 18 months or so, um, mm-hmm. she might've unintentionally um, done the exact opposite of what she wanted to. She might've been a, um, it, she wouldn't have, but her passing might have been a burden on her daughters, and it, it could have had the exact um, unintended, unintended consequences that she wanted to actually, in fact, have happen. So I, I think that's a great testament to the fact that, A, she stepped up and put the necessary planning in place to make an otherwise difficult situation a little bit uh, less difficult when it comes to having things organized and having her final wishes documented and, and things of that nature. So I, I think that's a, a bittersweet, but a great story about the importance and the power of the work that you're doing for your clients. So I'm glad, I'm glad you shared both of those. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. And um, yeah, I, I think that what, what you and I do, you know, we, we come at some, some, something from, you know, similar angles, but slightly different angles. And um, I'm just really grateful that, that I discovered this, you know, that I, that I recognize this and that, that I'm doing it and that you recognized it and that you're doing it. And I just feel like it's, it's, I always tell, I always tell people, I tell us, I, you know, I have a son, I have a 16 year old son, I have a 17 year old daughter. And I, I talk to my son a lot about, you know, this has nothing to do with me not wanting a man to succeed or not wanting men to succeed or not want men to make decisions. This is just about, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if like there was never a question of, you know, equality? There was never a question of like, you know, who's going to be empowered to make a decision at any given moment or who has the knowledge to make a decision. It's just about, you know, bringing things sort of in a balance into balance a little bit. And, you know, so what you and I do, I think that's what we do is we bring, we're bringing things in into more balance. I I agree. And I I think, I think that's actually very well said. I think even in a happy committed relationship, um, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the benefits of being a relationship is division of labor. I mean, there's nothing wrong with one spouse, whether that's the, you know, husband, wife, uh, regardless of the situation, kind of taking a lead on the family finances, but that does not, uh, that does not 
give the other person a license to abdicate or like check out from the finances or from the estate planning or from the other, you know, major decisions. So um, I think, I think there's a, a fine line and a lot of gray area, frankly, around um, letting one spouse handle um, more of one topic than another, but also finding a, a healthy way to include everyone when it comes to decision strategy, where are we going? Why are we doing things the way we are? And I think there's, I think that presents a huge opportunity, which um, you and I um, separately are, are kind of doing our best to, you know, put a dent into that. And I, and I, I think, uh, I think it's, it's great work and it's very rewarding work. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to learn more and share more about the work you're, you're doing through your law practice, Amy. Um, what's, um, we're, we're coming up on an hour. We could, we could probably easily talk for another hour or two. Um, but as we start to wrap up, what surprised you most about your, uh, about your work? Um, how well received it was. So I remember, <laughs> um, I remember like making the decision to say, nope, I'm all in on women and, um, being afraid as a business owner that I was excluding half of the population out there, that it would be offensive or that I would not be successful. So from a pure business owner standpoint, I'm surprised by how well received it is. You and I touched upon it. Like even, you know, men seek out our services because they are in a relationship with someone who they, with whom they want to, to be, you know, um, an equal partner with, or they want to, you know, have somebody to go to, to ask questions or their daughters. So that's part, you know, that's partly, you know, I guess an answer to your question. The other thing that I am so surprised by, and I know this is a little strange is, is um, I, I, I'm so deeply um, grateful when someone comes to me and they have already had an estate plan in place and they share with me that they never knew what they didn't know about the estate plan that they had in place <laughs> and that they're grateful for a chance to go through the estate planning process with us because we spend so much time on education and sharing with them, you know, the pros and cons of answering something or, or I let them decide what's a pro and what's a con. And I just share, well, this is what this is. And so I'm very surprised by um, the desire for that piece that education, you know, even with individuals who have estate plans in place already. So I think those would be the two things that I'm surprised at the most. It's, it's interesting that last point, I, I too have experienced uh, women um, or couples that have come to me and maybe they have a, a financial plan in place or a portfolio. Maybe they've made some decisions, but when I asked them why they did not, not in an, not in an accusing or judgmental um, mm -hmm. uh, context, but just ask them, like, help me understand why, why did you make this decision or why did you choose to do this instead of that? And um, oftentimes, well, not often, but um, occasionally I, I just kind of get a deer in the headlights look like they're, they're not really sure because somebody advised them to do that. And I don't know that they really had the benefit of understanding why they were being told they should or should do this or shouldn't do that. So I think, um, I think it's, I think that's both, uh, an interesting editorial on the state of, uh, of a lot of professional advice, whether that's legal or financial, but I, I, I agree. I think it prevents or presents, excuse me, a, a wonderful opportunity to, to go back and, and help people better understand what they have, why they have it. And, and then they can make better decisions as to whether or not they need to make any, make any adjustments or accommodations to, you know, looking forward once they have a, a fuller understanding of what's going on. So I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Amy, you good on time. I've got a couple other things I wanted to cover. I'm good. Um, so this is Women's Retirement Radio. Um, everything that I do and talk about and write about um, has a tie into retirement for women and their families. So when you think of the retir word retirement personally, uh, what comes to mind for you? Ooh. Okay, so I'm actually about to be an empty nester in the next two years. <laughs> so um, I'm in this phase of like, oh, when is that going to be? What does that look like? I'm like there, like I'm kind of moving past the, uh, you know, this particular chapter right now because my daughter heads off to college this fall. So personally, 
I cannot see myself not working or not doing something um, of meaning. And of course, very subjectively, whatever that means to me, um, I, I honest to goodness, um, I think of retirement as having opportunities, more opportunities to be able to do maybe some of the things that now, because of certain financial obligations, um, because I, I chose motherhood, um, or motherhood chose me, whatever, um, you know, we chose to live a certain lifestyle as a, as a, as a married couple. And so I have certain obligations. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working and I love what I do, but I am working for for certain financial goals and to meet obligations and to save for the future. But what I see as retirement as, is having fewer of those needs on me and more of flexibility and ability. I mean, some people call it freedom to, to make more choices every day on what I do. Cause I will always do like, whether it's creating this or that or tutoring or, you know, my passion for learning and edu- like teaching and educating and whatever, but does that answer your question or did it I just did. ramble? <laughs> no, you didn't. It, it does. I, 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 and okay. it's interesting how often the, the word or the idea of freedom or, or choice or options comes up. Um, but no, you, you answered that uh, nicely. So, th- so thank you for that. Um, and from your perspective as an attorney working with women, helping them put estate plans and protection plans in place for themselves or for the people that they care about um, in their lives, how would you say that your work um, impacts women and their families as, as these women are planning for their own transition into retirement? Yeah. So I think the impact is twofold, if I may. The first is um, that bit that I mentioned about organization. I I truly think that what we do, it, like, again, it's a little different a lot of times. And, and I didn't know it was different until people started telling me it was different. But we we work pretty intentionally with our clients to help them organize what they do and don't know about their their lives from an asset uh, perspective. Um, Many clients, again, you know, won't know who they have named as beneficiaries, won't even remember where that life insurance policy is. And so we're helping them organize, doing that planning around the plan that I mentioned earlier. Um, So I think when women are are heading towards retirement or even just entered into retirement, that's a really critical time to know all of that information and understand all of that. And so I feel like that's one major thing that we do to benefit women during that time. The second thing is the conversations that happen after, or even sometimes during estate planning and the conversations with family members, because we encourage conversations, you know, depending on the situation, but for the most part, almost all of the women that we work with, um, have individuals in their life, you know, whether it be adult children or siblings, nieces and nephews, having conversations about what that looks like for them, that caregiving piece that they they will need one day um, in retirement, that because we're so busy caring for others, sometimes we never stop and think about who's going to carry it for us or what we want. Do we want to be at home doing it? Um, you know, do we want to, to be elsewhere? What does that community look like? Um, the conversations that we encourage individuals to have are actually some of the things that our clients come back and tell us after the fact, or, you know, even during that they're very grateful for because they never really stop to think about explaining to their children what these documents mean or explaining to their sister or brother who's going to be using these documents, what these documents will do for them, where to find them, you know, what information they're going to need to, you know, to do something with a financial power of attorney or uh, an advanced directive. So the, you know, organization and conversations. Yeah. I, I don't know that you um, just from my perspective, I don't know that you could have, um, wrap that up more nicely than you just did. I mean, between, between the organization piece, which is 
uh, I found always super helpful and super appreciated by the women that I work with. But the conversations is really uh, powerful. And you mentioned earlier in the conversation how women often are so wired into this caregiver role, whether they're caring for aging parents or maybe siblings or maybe uh, maybe even their children at some stage or another, that they often forget to put the proverbial oxygen mask on themselves first. Um, and so I think going through these conversations, the estate planning process, making sure that they have a bulletproof estate plan in place um, to make sure their wishes are carried out, to make sure they're not a burden on their children or their family or, or whatever you know is most important to them, I think is I think is a wonderful gift that people can give themselves with, you know, the help of a compassionate guide like, like you. So um, I think that's, I think that's awesome. A um, couple more things that we, as we start to wrap up, I know you've got a couple teenagers at home, one of whom is playing travel baseball. Uh, one of whom is going to college here in the not too distant future. You're running a, a thriving law practice. Um, when you win, maybe I should say if, but uh, when you have an hour or two all to yourself, um, how do you how do you enjoy spending your downtime, Amy? Um, so I have gotten better at this. I was not good at allowing myself to play. <laughs> um, I think as adults, we always, especially as women, we feel like we have to be productive every moment of the day and you know, I think there's been, so I see self-care, I think it's an over cliched word, but I see it as a revolutionary act um, and, or inaction, I guess a revolutionary action or inaction. And so I like to play and sometimes play for me means um, I am creating something. Um, I, again, I like to study religion. So sometimes that means that I'm comparing to religious texts or <laughs> sometimes that honest to goodness means that I am like binge watching something like, you know, Parks and Rec or, <laughs> you know, something else on, um, Netflix or Amazon prime or something. But I, I have allowed myself to be fluid with my, with that hour and it's whatever in that moment I feel like I need. And sometimes I need to just pick up a romance novel or pick up a, a, a very technical theological text. So I'm kind of all over the place when it comes to what I like to do to relax. I do like to sit on my back porch. I'm not, uh, it's, it's something I love to do too. Nice. Well, from one Parks and Rec fan to another, I, uh, I think that's a, I think that's a wonderful um, and diverse answer. So thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. Amy, we've covered a ton today. This has been a lot of fun. Um, if there were one thing that our listeners could take away from our conversation today, what would you want that one thing to be? Mm, I would say that... Um, if something is inside of you saying that you think you need to find out more about estate planning, or if you've asked yourself the question, why do I need a will? Um, just reach out to us or reach out to an estate planner near you and get that, get that little nagging inside question answered. To me, I just sort of feel like there is a reason that you're asking it in your gut and follow that. I don't know. Does that answer your question? It, it, uh, it does. And the next logical question is um, for people that either have that nagging question in the back of their mind, or they just listen to this and said, Amy sounds like the coolest person ever. I need to reach mm -hmm. out to her and learn more about uh, her law practice. What's the best way for people to learn more or to reach out or get in touch? So they can reach out to us um, by phone, 770-508-6525. We, you know, we are in the Metro Atlanta area, um, which is where primarily we help our clients. And, and we're in the, we are in the Northern Metro area. And I, again, the majority of our clients are from the Northern Metro area of Atlanta, um, licensed in Georgia, just to be super clear about that, um, Georgia and Florida, but primarily Georgia is where we practice. Um, you could also go to our website, www.AtlantaWills, W-I-L-L-S, and A-N-D Trusts, plural, T-R-U-S-T-S.com. So Atlanta Wills and 
trusts.com. And you can reach out our contact page. We also have, um, you know, a lot of good information on our website. Uh, and it links also out to our YouTube as well that you can get a lot of, if you're a video person and you want to watch videos, you can link out through our website to them. We also have a Facebook page. I mean, we're on all the places. So we have a Facebook page as well. Um, and so, yeah, we're the only um, law firm in Georgia that's really serving women. So if you if you type um, women-based or women-focused law firm, we, we should be what pops up on, you know, Google if my SEO is working properly. And we'll be, uh, we'll be sure to include links to your website, your phone number, your Facebook page, um, YouTube channel, LinkedIn, all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, so people will be able to reach out and, and discuss things further if, uh, if they're inclined to do so. So, um, Amy, this has been, this has been a blast. I, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. I'm happy we got to share this conversation with our listeners. Um, anything else you want to touch on before we wrap it up? Um, not specifically about me. I, I just appreciate you having this opportunity in this moment for, for professionals to, to come have a conversation with you and talk through these important issues, you know, especially, you know, focus again, focusing on women, but if, focusing on this particular stage for women, because there are so many questions and so many resources that can get lost on Google land out there. Um, but to have it here, you know, in one place is, is a great thing. So I, I appreciate the work that you're doing here. Well, thank you. And, and having conversations like this is, is a lot of fun and it doesn't feel like work at all. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to do it and we'll have to, uh, we'll have to have a follow-up conversation down the road. So, uh, so thanks for joining us uh, today, Amy. And um, thanks everyone out, uh, out there for listening. Um, again, this is Russ Thornton. This has been Women's Retirement Radio, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you on our next episode. It's Russ again, and before you go, I want to provide a brief disclosure. You should consult a financial advisor familiar with the specific circumstances of your unique financial situation before making any financial decisions. Nothing in this broadcast constitutes a solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities. Any mentioned rates of return are historical or hypothetical in nature and are not a guarantee of future returns. I'm a financial advisor and an investment advisor representative of Wealthcare Capital Management, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor based in Richmond, Virginia. The views discussed in this podcast are my own and may not be consistent with or represent those of Wealthcare Capital Management.